Okay, so uh, good morning everyone and very warm welcome from the United Kingdom. Thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, as we said, it's quite early for us in the UK, especially for those of us that have been working for the last few weeks. Um, so thank you for joining us for our Prevent and Protect Dental Summit. Uh, and my contribution to the day, which is effective reduction of aerosol in the dental clinic, which should follow on nicely from uh, Marcel's presentation. Um, this is gonna be a very practical guide to how we might manage the aerosols that Marcel talked about once we're all back in clinic. Um, if I can just take a moment as well to thank the Swiss Dental Academy for inviting me to speak today. I think they have done a tremendous job uh, managing to put together such a, a relevant educational programme at such short notice. It is very difficult to do. So thank you to the Swiss Dental Academy and thank you to everyone involved in oops, putting today's programme together. So for those of you that don't know me, my name is Faye Donald. I am a registered dental hygienist over here in the UK, uh, working in general dental clinic and uh, up until around the third week of March, which was seven or eight weeks ago now, I was using uh, GBTs, so ultrasonic and airflow full time in my clinics. I'm also a certified Swiss Dental Academy trainer, which means I regularly get to deliver courses all over the UK and into some other countries now too, which is always a pleasure. Um, and as ever, I am very happy to be speaking to you today. Uh, just before we get started, I think it's really important to acknowledge that although I'm broadcasting from the UK today, I know that we have lots of listeners tuning in from across the globe where the situation differs from country to country. So some uh, haven't yet returned to work like us in the UK. Uh, some places will have reopened but won't be using aerosol equipment. Some will have returned to normal and uh, some will have never shut down at all. So we've got a very broad spectrum of listeners tuning in today, um, all at varying stages. This webinar is designed to give guidance for a safe, return to managing aerosols. That is when and only when uh, your country and your local authority allows the use of aerosol generating equipment again. It's very important to highlight that this is not meant to override instructions uh, given out by individual governing bodies. Once we're permitted to return to our full scope of practice, hopefully the information in this webinar will leave you uh, very well positioned to proceed safely and uh, with confidence. If you haven't yet seen this document, then it's worth taking a look at. This is EMS's official guidelines released this week. Um, and it very clearly documents their advice and recommendations for the safe use of aerosol post COVID-19. Uh, it's been put together by their clinical experts and is relevant to anyone uh, generating aerosols. Um, and it clearly outlines EMS's recommendations going forwards. Um, you'll find a catalogue of references to support how and why they came to the conclusions they came to. Um, and there's also some quite useful links in there should you want them as well. So a great document and uh, one that we can all make use of. It's available to download on the EMS website. So hopefully, like I say, you've all just listened to Dr. Marcel Donne. Um, uh, a webinar which was um, on just before me today. Um, if you did, then you'll have a much greater understanding of, of what aerosol is and which aerosols are specifically relevant to us in clinical practice. For those of you that didn't tune in, I'll give a very brief overview, but very brief. So I highly recommend you go um, and, and view Dr. Marcel's webinar if you didn't see it. It was a very informative, very clear presentation. Um, we're also going to take a look at the five uh, stages of managing an aerosol uh, and I'll take you through those five stages, um, including pre-op mouth rinse, the use of universal barriers, where we position ourselves and the patients and high and low volume suction and technique. Um, 
particular technique we're going to concentrate on today because that's really, really important. And hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll all feel a little bit more in control because this situation is very alien to us. Um, I think as dental clinicians, we're very used to being in control. Um, we're very much captains of our ship in surgery and, and we're used to control. What we're not very good at and what we don't like is being out of control. Uh, which is the situation we find ourselves in now. It places us very much out of our comfort zone and it makes us feel uncomfortable and anxious because it's not what we're used to. So I'm going to try and hand you back some of that control and boost your confidence a little bit by giving you some sensible, achievable and practical guidance. Okay, so as I say, I'm very, very briefly in one slide going to run through this just for the benefit of those listeners who didn't catch Dr. Donne. Um, by definition, the aerosols that we refer to and are known to us in the dental setting are referred to as tiny particles that remain suspended in the air. The important part of that definition is remain suspended in the air. I've heard aerosols and droplets and splatter confused quite a lot in the last few weeks. So, so let's try and clear this up. Um, it's actually quite easy to differentiate, as Marcel said, between aerosol and droplet because there is a very definitive line between the two. If the particle is less than 50 micrometers in diameter, then it's, it's an aerosol. Um, if the diameter is greater than 50 micrometers, then it's considered a droplet or splatter. Droplets are easily differentiated from aerosols because they are visible to the naked eye. So we can see them. Aerosol um, particles are not visible to the naked eye. Um, so what you can see when you're working with aerosol generating equipment isn't the aerosol, it's the droplets. Um, the aerosol is the stuff that we can't see. Um, and why is that important? Well, mostly because we don't tend to breathe droplets in. Droplets are generally between 50 and 500 micrometers, so they're, they're much bigger, which means that we can see them. And more importantly, because they're bigger, they're also heavier, so they tend to fall quickly to the ground. Um, they're too heavy to be suspended in the air, and therefore they don't make it into the aerosol, um, and, and, and we don't tend to breathe them in. The particles we're most concerned with is those which are small, so like I say, less than 50 micrometers and cannot be seen with a naked eye, um, are very light and, and easily suspended in the air. So we can breathe them in. Um, and they also tend to travel the furthest too. So on average, one, two, three meters from the original source. Um, the smaller the aerosol particle, the more potential it has to penetrate um, and lodge in the smaller airways. Hence, these carry the greatest potential for transmitting infection. So when we think about aerosol and how to contain it, we need to think less about the droplets, um, like the ones we can see here in the pictures, and focus our attention instead on the particles that we can't see and are floating around in the air. They're the ones of more concern to us. It's not that the droplets don't matter. Of course they do, because they can be contaminated and can land on us and land on the surfaces around us, which we can then touch and indirectly contaminate ourselves. Um, but that's where our additional PPE and good hand washing and surgery dis disinfection comes in. I believe those sort of topics are being covered uh, later in today's programme, so I'm not going to go into that with you now. What we're going to focus on is how do we practically contain those aerosol particles that carry the greatest risk to us and stop them getting into the air around us. I have literally fee fielded um, hundreds of messages and calls in the last few weeks from, quite frankly, uh, frantic clinicians fearing for their lives in some cases. So I know that for some of you controlling this aerosol um, that you can't see and you can't smell and you can't touch seems almost like an impossible task. But, but really, I'm here to tell you that it's not that complicated and I'm gonna show you some simple adjustments that we can all make that will leave next to no aerosol at all and will dramatically reduce any risk uh, to us, to our colleagues, to our patients. So fear not, I have got my Wonder Woman outfit on today and I am uh, determined to help you see things differently. So really there are five stages to managing an aerosol. Um, first of all, pre-procedural mouth rinse. 
um, which we're going to talk about, universal barrier we're going to go into, high volume and low volume suction at all times, maintaining good posture and position is more important than it's ever been uh, and I'm going to explain why and we're going to look at the correct angulation and technique and I'm going to talk you through each of these step by step. So let's start with pre-procedural mouth rinse. Now let's be clear here. Um, the use of mouth rinse prior to aerosol generating procedures has always been a recommendation prior to treatment. Whether we actually did it is another matter, but for many years we've had studies confirming that using a chlorhexidine solution for 30 to 60 seconds prior to treatment reduces the microbial counts in the oral cavity and subsequently the microbial load in the aerosol by up to 70 percent. Now the problem we have is that corona is a virus and unfortunately chlorhexidine shows very low effectiveness against viruses so pre-procedural mouth rinse is only protecting us from the bacterial load and not the viral load. Um, and this is where hydrogen peroxide, that I'm sure you've heard lots about lately, um, this is where it comes in. So hydrogen peroxide, a concentration of at least 0.5% is proven to effectively kill viruses. Now, I should make it clear at this point, there is currently no data available confirming that hydrogen peroxide present in a mouth rinse is effective specifically against the coronavirus. What we do know is that hydrogen peroxide is effective against all the other viruses that it's been tested on. Remember COVID-19 is a new strain of corona, so, so there's still lots of work to be done on testing. Based on the information available, which has been taken from studies that looked into how effective hydrogen peroxide has been on the other viruses, we can deduce that a mouth rinse with a, an, an oxidative mechanism such as hydrogen peroxide will be effective against coronavirus. At this stage, it is a good calculated conclusion to draw, but it's nothing more. Now, assuming we're going to follow the recommendation to use hydrogen peroxide pre-op mouth rinse, what we don't want to do is concentrate so much on killing the virus that we then forget that it's still as important as it always was for us to reduce the bacterial load too. Uh, that would be complete madness. So we've got a couple of options. We can continue as we've always done with our chlorhexidine or CPC, uh, depending on which country you're in. If you're in America and I believe Japan, then it would be CPC rather than chlorhexidine. Um, and then add to that um, a separate hydrogen peroxide rinse. So we'd ask our patients first to gargle with hydrogen peroxide mouth wash for at least 15 seconds and repeat that every 30 minutes or at the end of the session, whichever comes first. And then we'd ask them to also rinse with a chlorhexidine or a CPC for at least 60 seconds. And this would be perfectly a perfectly acceptable way to do it. The second option we have, and to my knowledge, this is the only one that I know of out there. There's now a mouthwash being produced by EMS, which is called Viropro X. Um, EMS have collaborated with experts in the field of uh, chemistry and dentistry to develop this mouth rinse that is both antiviral and antibacterial. Uh, it's a new solution developed in response to COVID-19 and it contains 1.5% hydrogen peroxide and 0.05% uh, CPC, which effectively kills viruses as well as bacteria. Um, with this mouthwash, patient, patients are advised to rinse and gargle. It's really important when we get our patients uh, doing their pre-op rinse that we ask them to gargle so we get right to the back of the throat. Um, uh, and we'd ask them to use uh, Viropro X for 60 seconds at the beginning of each treatment and again repeat the process every 30 minutes. Um, I'm told that Viro, uh, Viropro X, uh, the combination mouthwash, is ready and should be available to buy very shortly from your usual EMS stockists, um, which would be hopefully next month. So next we're going to consider the role of the universal barrier. What we mean by the term universal barrier is something that will retract the lips, 
uh, and the cheeks around the mouth and ideally that needs to be even retra retraction which um, in turn will improve your visibility and make the treatment field field um, more easily accessible which makes the whole area more easy to manage it's much easier to aspirate effectively if you're not having to hold back and manage the soft tissues inside the mouth um, the one seen here is called Optrigate uh, and is now recommended by EMS for use during aerosol generating procedures, particularly for those clinicians uh, practicing two-handed dentistry. A school, skilled uh, suction technique in combination with Optrigate supports the reduction of aerosol very, very well. Um, and if we get this right, then our risk is going to be very, very low. So like I said, this is called Optrigate and is manufactured by a company called Ivoclare, uh, Ivoclare Vivident. Um, they are the manufacturers and Optrigate is their biggest selling product worldwide. So it's available right across the globe in all countries. Ivoclare don't sell direct. Uh, you'll find different dental companies will, will sell it depending on which country you're in. I'm sure if you ask your usual dental suppliers, you'll soon find some um or somebody that's stocking it it's very soft um, and flexible so it's very comfortable for the patients to wear it's also latex free so we don't have any issues with causing allergies for patients it can be a little fiddly to put in when you first start using it but it's quite easy to manipulate once you get the hang of it so um, it doesn't take long for you get for you to get used to the technique it comes in different sizes. So they have a pediatric ones for children, which are pink and blue. Um, and then they've got adult ones, which are uh, small, medium and large. I'm told the regular um, and small are the ones most commonly used. Um, I believe I've acquired a mixed box with, box with, with 40 small, 40 regular, uh, but I think you can order boxes of whichever sizes you need. On the packet, there's this little size guide or ruler, which helps you determine which of the three sizes is right for your patient's mouth. I only discovered this about six months ago and it made choosing the right size an awful lot easier. You just need to fold back the packet and hold the guide up to your patient's mouth. There we go. Uh, whilst the mouth's closed and then measure corner to corner. If you choose the wrong size, it can be more difficult to get into position and more uncomfortable for the patient. So it's worth um, using the ruler to avoid any wastage. There are some really good videos on the Ivoclare website and on YouTube if you want more tips and advice on how to use it. Um, it really is very quick and, and very easy for you to get used to. Um, and patients seem to find it very comfortable, so I, I don't usually get complaints. Once in place, which takes under 30 seconds, I'd say you've got a very clear field of vision um, and good access for effective aspiration in your working area. Now, I spoke to the marketing manager from Ivoclare yesterday, who very kindly has given me a code to share with you. Um, this code will give you access to a free sample of this product. Um, I understand Ivoclare are experiencing increased demand at the moment, as you can imagine. So you might find it's a few weeks before your free sample arrives. Um, but I'll put that, that um, code up in the chat box at the end for anybody that wants to get themselves a free sample. Okay, so um, let's just consider our posture and position for a moment, um, and that is position of the patient. Um, this picture of me was taken before COVID-19, so please ignore the PPE, which will now look very different to how it does here. Um, so I think much of this is common sense, but it's still worth revisiting anyway, just to remind ourselves, because I think we're all guilty of perhaps falling into bad habits without necessarily realising it. So what what we know is that the working position adopted during treatment can potentially increase the risk to clinicians if it's incorrect because if we reach around and place ourselves in front of the patient which commonly happens when we're trying to see the upper posterior teeth in particular then it makes sense that we are more likely to have any escaping droplets or splatter or aerosol come directly in contact with our faces and bodies studies have shown this so they found that that there's 
the most amount of droplet and aerosol landing around the area of the patient's chest than anywhere else. So it, it makes sense that if, if we're working with our faces or arms or bodies in front of the patient's mouth, then that escapes aerosol and tiny droplets are going to land on us too. Um, it's probably a little bit easier to explain this if we go back to thinking um, about the face of a clock to describe positions where 12 o'clock is the top of the patient's head, 6 o'clock is the patient's chin or feet. So it's very important that we always position ourselves behind the patient. This is generally between 10 and 2 o'clock depending on, on how we position the head. Um, or in the areas uh, labelled here, so direct rear, left rear and right rear. We never ever stray to nine o'clock or three o'clock or beyond or, or into the direct right, direct left, front right and front left positions um, seen here. And ideally, we stay as close to 12 o'clock in the direct rear position as possible. Now, this might contradict or go against some of what we were taught at university or dental school, but we must remember that many of the positions we were taught to use were to accommodate the angulation required uh, for correct manipulation of hand scalers during root planing. With GBT, our minimal intervention approach, we no yes, longer do any root planing and um, it just isn't necessary to adopt all of these different positions around the patient, moving around them constantly. Um, so it makes working much easier. One thing we should never ever do is ask the patient to tilt their head towards us um, during the treatment, despite what we were taught, and despite how much easier it might be to use direct vision, um, it's a very easy trap to fall into and it puts us directly in line with the patient's mouth and any escaping droplets. This is the wrong position to find ourselves in. Uh, when generating aerosols. Much better um, is that wherever we can, we ask the patient to tilt the head away from us so that we remain behind them in the direct rear position or 12 o'clock. Um, we use our mirrors and our mirrored aspirators to help us see. This will also help us to maintain good spinal posture um, and it will sure, ensure that any escaping aerosol and droplets fall away from us rather than towards us this is the correct position to adopt. We shouldn't really have much need to move beyond 11 o'clock or one o'clock. And if we do need to go to 10 or two, then always keep the patient's head um, turned away from us, like I say. Next thing to consider is the quality of our high volume evacuation system. So, so, so what exactly does that mean? Uh, in the UK, we tend to call it big suction or wide bore suction or large aspirator. You might have different names um, in your countries, but the most widely accepted term is HVE, which stands for high volume evacuation. This is where we learn that our high volume evacuation isn't there just to keep the working area clean and it isn't there just to stop the patients from getting a wet face. It's there for a much more important reason. It's there to keep us safe and to keep our patients safe. And now more than ever, its role is being defined as absolutely crucial in the containment of aerosol during dental procedures. Um, so let's have a little look at why. So studies have long since shown that the use of high volume um, suction during aerosol procedures uh, can reduce 90 to 98 percent of aerosols regardless of their source. So this isn't specific, um, it, it's, it's any aerosol generating equipment in dentistry. So let's just take a moment to let that sink in. Aerosol poses one of the greatest risks to us and yet we have this simple tool that can reduce it by up to 98%. That is a huge number. That leaves potentially only 2% of an aerosol for us to have to deal with post-procedure. And if you listen to Marcel, you'll understand that of that 2%, probably only 50% of it is contaminated anyway. Suddenly that's a very different picture and a much more manageable situation and our risk is dramatically reduced. The less aerosol there is, it, it, it's going to um, catch much of the droplet and the splatter that we mentioned before, uh, which will further reduce our risk of indirect contamination. Um, think about what we know about transmission routes. 
it's a, a very inexpensive compared to um, some of the machines I've seen floated around on social media lately. Uh, very inexpensive on a per patient basis. Um, however, there is a but, and that's where this webinar comes in. So size, volume, flow speed, and most, import most importantly, technique, all play a huge role in getting that 98% reduction. Um, so let's look at those things in more detail. Uh, before we go on to technique. So what constitutes high volume? What does that actually mean? Well, number one on the list is size. Quite simply, the wider the opening to the aspirator, the bigger the area it will cover, um, and the, uh, the um, more aerosol it's gonna collect. We have to strike a balance here to ensure that the aspirator is workable. It isn't so big that it, it obstructs our field of vision. Um, the recommendation and the optimum size bore or opening is uh, an eight millimeter diameter, which most are. So, so just under a centimeter. I don't have any figures on aspirators with a smaller opening because they were found to be less efficient. So, so they were discarded. And number two um, is is volume and flow speed. So, so it needs to be at least three hundred liters per minute make sure that your suction unit is serviced regularly and in accordance with manufacturer's guidelines and in full working order. So clogged up pipelines or split pipes or blocked filters or suction speed that drops off when someone else in the building is using their aspirator. These are all things that are gonna result in reduced efficiency. So we, so we must absolutely make sure that we give priority to maintaining our suction units as well as everything else in the dental setting. Less than 300 liters a minute um, and, and you're not gonna be reducing the aerosol as effectively. Think about that 98% mark. That's what we're aiming for. That's our goal. Um, and what a difference it makes to our safety if we do manage to achieve it. Under, underperforming units um, are just no longer going to be okay for us. So moving on to the aspirator tips. These are the aspirators that I use. They are called PureVac. Again, it depends which country you're in as to who your dealers will be. Um, and there's a few features that I like. So the opening's nice and wide. It fits the eight millimeter recommendation. It's uh, rounded, so they're generally more comfortable for the patients than the ones with the sharp pointed edges. I particularly like them because the shank is, is quite short. So I find control uh, much more precise than with a, with a longer tube. Uh, and they're curved, so, so access and visibility isn't impaired. You'll also notice that they have a mirror on the end, which I find incredibly useful for access in certain areas, which, which stops me from drifting out of the correct position that we just mentioned and falling into those bad habits of bending around the front of the patient to use direct vision. We're gonna come onto technique and positioning in a moment, but, but I think those clinicians working independently or those who choose to aspirate for themselves during the aerosol procedures, the mirror really is very, very helpful. Um, it's also a very good quality mirror. So for me, it's no different to looking into the dental mirror. Um, it doesn't fog up either. So, um, so it, it really does replace your dental mirror for the large part. Um, and yes, just to confirm, they are autoclavable. For those of you working in the UK, before anybody asks me, due to their shorter length and some clever design features, they do meet the regulations for standard autoclaving and therefore they meet our CQC regulations. So you can put these through your autoclave and safely reuse them. That also means that economically they're a little more viable um, and of course they're more environmentally friendly because we've got less plastic waste which is a pet hate of mine so they tick that box for me too. Just to be clear this is not a sales pitch it doesn't have to be these ones that you choose to use. Um, these are the ones that I have found work best for me and work best in my hands but you might well be different. Um, they did take a few days to adjust to because they are bigger than the one that I was previously using. Uh, but by nature, we're, we're very dexterous individuals, so it didn't take me very long. Those of you that have purchased one of the new EMS prophylaxis master units will have had one of these supplied with your airflow. 
Um, so give it a go if you haven't yet had it out of the box. Um, they are the aspirator recommended for use with the EMS units now. Okay, so low volume suction. So uh, these would be better known to us as saliva ejectors. The clue is in the title. They are designed to remove excess saliva and fluid only. Um, that's what they're designed for and that's what they should be used for. As this diagram nicely shows, several studies have demonstrated that saliva ejectors um, remove virtually no aerosol at all. I know these are often the aspirator of choice for clinicians that work alone, uh, but they are really not adequate to manage an aerosol environment at all. We should be thinking now not just about convenience, but about our personal safety um, as we return to work. And, and this is just one of the changes that I think many clinicians should be looking at making. That said, there is still a place for saliva ejectors. The studies that showed the highest reduction in aerosol, remember we're aiming for that 98%. Um, they had both low volume suction and high volume suction. So the low volume suction was hooked at the back of the mouth and the high volume suction followed the instrument around. Now, the saliva ejector didn't help with the aerosol, um, but what it, but it, what it will have done by keeping that low volume aspiration in place, um, there was no interruption. Um, so sometimes what happens is we'll, we'll move the high volume suction away from the instrument to the back of the throat to collect the excess fluid. And that then takes us away from the source of the aerosol. aerosol. Um, whereas if we've got low volume suction in the back at the same time, then, then we don't need to do that. We can keep the high volume suction right where it needs to be, right next to um, the working instrument. Um, so we should be considering always high volume and low volume suction going forwards at the same time. Uh, this is now the recommendation based on the studies done on aerosol management um, by EMS um, going forwards. So next we move on to the importance of the angulation. By this I mean both the angulation of the high volume suction but also your airflow handpiece or your piece on handpiece because the two work side by side. We want to try and control the bounce back of the spray so that when it bounces off the tooth it's directed towards the aspirator tip. A little like if we were pay playing catch with a ball against a wall, we wouldn't throw it perfectly horizontally at the wall because it would probably bounce back and hit us in the face. Um, we'd throw it at an angle. Um, and airflow is a little bit similar. So we want to control where that spray go goes. So if we angle the handpiece so that the spray hits the tooth surface between 30 and 60 degrees, then when the spray and the aerosol bounce off that surface, they're going to bounce directly towards the aspirator and up inside it, traveling at quite some speed, as Marcel um, explained earlier. There are other reasons for this um, also. So this 30 to 60 degree angle will generate the right uh, kinetic energy um, and that ensures the most efficient use, which in turn will reduce our treatment time and thus reduces the length of time we're potentially exposed to the aerosol. Remember the handpiece itself wants to be a few millimetres away from the tooth surface too to ensure um, efficiency and good directional spray. This also, like I say, applies to the P-Zone and the ultrasonic. You don't want the high volume suction to be so close to the tip that the water goes straight up the aspirator because you'll lose the cooling effect and the cavitational effect and probably damage your instruments, uh, not to mention hurt your patients too. So we have to be careful to position ourselves close enough to catch the spray before it's released into the atmosphere, but, but far enough away so it was not to impact on the working mechanisms um, of the ultrasonic and the airflow. Um, it's perhaps better demonstrated in this diagram. On the left, we see the incorrect angulation, where the angle of the handpiece is, is greater than 60 degrees, more like 90 degrees here. Um, this is a really inefficient way to use our airflow. We get lots of powder accumulation on the surface and we don't get the kinetic energy required for efficient biofilm disruption, which means the procedure takes much longer. The spray generated from this incorrect angulation is naturally going to go in all different directions, including back at us. And this is going to make it very difficult to control with just one aspirator. Um, 
and this is typically when we'd see patients faces getting wet or our visors being covered in water and powder droplets at the end of the session your visor should be clear we shouldn't be covered we sh our visors shouldn't be covered in debris at the end of the session it should never never happen if it does happen then it's pretty certain that you've either got the angulation of your handpiece incorrect or the angulation of your aspirator incorrect now pay attention to the diagram on the right hand side this shows clearly how by changing the angulation of your handpiece to less than 60 degrees the spray bouncing off the tooth surface is much more controlled um, and it's all going to go in the same direction and we can easily place our high volume aspirator in just one position the technology in the handpiece ensures that the powder is encased within or surrounded by water spray um, so you won't ever get clouds of powder escaping into the atmosphere. What you need to focus on is the water spray that you can see and know that if you're collecting that, then you're, then you're also going to be collecting the aerosol as well. Um, so as well as getting the angle of the airflow, uh, spray correct we have to get our aspirator angle and technique right this is so important look we've been doing this for years right so so we're very highly trained we're highly skilled we're very manually dexterous clinicians we have been managing infectious diseases for a very long time and we can do this in our sleep so the intention here is not to patronize but more so to reinforce the message that high volume suction is now a must and no longer a should it is now mandatory that we apply a good high volume evacuation uh, system and the right technique is absolutely crucial there is no room for error here so so technique wise number one as i said a moment ago we need to use double suction so uh, the high volume of evacuation is going to be responsible for managing the aerosol and the spray coming directly from your handpiece so that it, uh, the low volume can then manage the saliva we don't want patients having saliva building up at the back of the throat and then wanting to swallow or even worse inhaling and then they start coughing that's the worst thing that could happen and we want to avoid that completely um, so that's why we place this low volume evacuator such as a saliva ejector at the back of the mouth just to hook it in and leave it there um, and then your high volume evacuator can can concentrate on the aerosol uh, number two get your settings right so the powder down as low as you need it if you're using plus powder that, that'll be a really low setting i generally work around level two um, and then ensure that your water is at maximum capacity um, and this will ensure the right speed and velocity and ensure the small powder particles are fully encased within that water tunnel um, and unable to escape into the atmosphere. Uh, and number three, get absolutely as close as you can to the contaminated spray. So if you listen to, to Marcel speak this morning, you'll understand the difference between the contaminated spray and aerosol and the non-contaminated spray and aerosol. So remember the spray or the aerosol isn't contaminated as it exits the handpiece because that comes straight from your water lines. Um, and the powder chamber it only becomes contaminated once it's in contact with the tooth so that's where the focus of your high volume evacuation needs to be you don't want to position yourself here um, before the spray has had any impact you want to be sat so that you're directly in line with where the contaminated aerosol is going to bounce so get in as close as you can to that and if you can even better that you're touching the tooth that it's bouncing off um, you just don't want to be over the other side of the mouth or too far away from the working site of the aerosol so it's got chance to escape into the atmosphere you want to catch it um, as close to the working site as you possibly can um, two-handed four-handed let's have this conversation so for those of you that don't know what it is it might be called different things in different countries two-handed dentistry refers to a clinician working alone hence two hands four-handed dentistry refers to a clinician with a dental assistant hence four hands now what i'm about to say shouldn't be misinterpreted and i want to be very clear about this what i am absolutely not saying is that we shouldn't have dental assistance at all. 
For some of our listeners, the hygienist having an assistant will be completely unheard of. I know that in some countries in Europe, dental assistants, are, assistants aren't commonplace for hygienists, but they tend to have much longer appointments. They tend to have one hour appointments. Um, and for others, it would be unthinkable for us not to have an assistant. In the UK, it's becoming much more common. We're all trained differently and we all have different experiences, which, um, which we, you know, we need to respect those differences. We do have studies that show that four-handed dentistry previously allowed optimal aspiration. Um, this should be noticed. The study at the bottom that I've referenced here particularly relates to coronavirus. I'm one of the many clinicians who feels very strongly that actually in order to do all that's expected of us in a very short time in the UK, our appointments are generally only 30 minutes. Um, then we absolutely must have chairside support. Now more than ever, it will become imperative that we have support to ensure adequate data collection, uh, efficient ter surgery turnaround, um, good cross infection and so on. However, what must also be said, and this is where the lines become a little bit blurred, when EMS carried out their research that Marcel referred to earlier, they looked into both two-handed and four-handed use of high volume aspiration and, and reaching that 98% aerosol uh, collection. What they found was that the control of the aerosol was better when the clinician worked two-handed than when they worked four-handed. Now that is very subjective. It might be because the clinicians they used weren't used to having an assistant, so they weren't harmonious with each other in the procedure. It might depend on how experienced the assistant is or how long you've worked together, how well you've trained him or her in the right technique. It might depend on uh, how intuitive your nurse is um, and how well he or she knows you and, and how good they are at reading your next move. Of course, it's much easier for, clinic, for, for a clinician's left hand to know what their right hand is going to do next. It's less easy for a second person to know what your next move is. That doesn't mean that it can't be done. Personally, I fall into both categories. So I have a, a dental assistant in surgery with, with me at all times. They are my absolute right arm. There is no way I could get through my appointments as efficiently as I do without them. Hi to any of my lovely nurses if you're listening. Um, and that will continue for as long as I am a practicing clinician. I feel really strongly about this. When it comes to actual aspiration, however, Sometimes I do do it by myself and sometimes my nurse does it and sometimes we switch between the two. So my nurse will help where there's good access and I'm confident that she can get the right angle. Um, and then where access isn't so easy, I'll take the aspirator and we'll happily work two handed. What I'm saying is don't rule anything out. The right suction technique from someone who is well trained and skilled is what's most important now. Now is the time when we're gonna have to reinvent ourselves and revisit our training and start to question some of our old habits and whether they're still the best way forwards as we enter the new normal, whatever that might be. This virus is not going away. So we have to be prepared to adapt and figure out what does and doesn't work for us to ensure our safety and our survival. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who's got hold of that aspirator, so long as it's positioned correctly and you are successfully and effectively and safely eliminated as much of that aerosol as possible without compromising on access and treatment outcomes. If you do have an assistant, then now is the time to make sure that they are properly trained. It's quite difficult for me to teach what is essentially a practical technique with words and pictures via a webinar. For those of you that still don't feel confident in their technique, then, um, then the Swiss Dental Academy do run courses delivered by uh, SDA trainers like myself in all the countries where EMS units are sold. So if you want to look into attending one of the courses to further boost your confidence and, and bring your assistants along by all means and have some hands-on training, then you can contact EMS representatives in your region and they'll be able to direct you towards the courses. 
So we're just about there, folks. Um, you see, I told you it wasn't that complicated. Um, I'm just going to quickly recap. So remember our five stages to successful management of aerosols, pre-procedural mouth rinse, uh, universal barrier, especially, especially if you're working on your own, but ideally at all times, high volume and low volume suction at all times, maintain good, safe positioning of yourself and of the patient, and absolutely the most important thing here is that you get the angulation and positioning of your high volume evacuation aspirator correct. This is the most important thing. And if you get this right, then the risk of aerosol ending up in the atmosphere around us should be absolutely minuscule. I cannot stress that part enough. Of course, you'll be wearing improved PPE and, and you'll be adopting some sort of um, air exchange, whether that's the window open, whatever it might be. Um, we understand, we understand uh, transmission routes, so our personal hygiene will be really good. Um, and actually, if we get this right, therefore, the risk ends up being very, very minimal. Let's remember, we are all highly trained, highly skilled clinicians. We understand infection control. We understand transmission routes. We understand personal hygiene and PPE. And we are so, so well trained to adapt quickly to situations that really we shouldn't be afraid of going forwards at all. We must learn. Uh, we must improve, adjust and come back stronger than we were before. None of this is unachievable and none of it is out of our reach. Once we have the information and the knowledge, then we have power. And all we have to do is channel that power into becoming an even better version of what we were before all of this happened. Strains of coronavirus will be with us for a very long time to come. Um, but so will biofilm and so will periodontal disease and so will dental caries. This is our opportunity to come back bigger and better and stronger than ever before. We can absolutely do this and, and we can do ourselves and our patients and our profession proud. We really can. So that's me done. Thank you once again for joining me and for listening. I really do appreciate your time. I'm happy to take any questions that have been posted. Um, so I think the wonderful man in my ear, my trusted assistant is going to read those out to me now. And just a couple of thanks on the screen as well to Professor Menze, uh, Dr. Donne, Swiss Dental Academy Online, Iva Claire Vividen and EMS who all, all produced and provided um, and contributed to this webinar today. So thank you to those as well. Thank you, Faye, for your great presentation. <clears throat> So we're going to go quickly through a few of the questions because we are quite tight on the schedule. So, well, we got a lot of people thanking you for this clear presentation. Um, okay, just let me filter quickly. So basically also, again, here is the fact that among the many steps that we are collecting in order to actually get a clever idea of how to manage the risks for the operator, for the patient, suctions plays definitely a muscle, a must role, definitely. So it's really the correct management of suction is crucial and strategic, definitely. Um, if you gargle uh, Clorex for a minute or so, will it not have a discoloration on the teeth or gums? Um, well, if you were going to do that every day, then that might be the case. But um, but remember, we're doing this prior to treatment, and we're going to we're going to then clean the teeth. So so any remains of corsodil, uh, chlorhexidine, sorry, um, would be removed during the cleaning procedure anyway. So um, I don't see that being a problem now. Uh, of course, I forgot to say, uh, if uh, any of the attendees want to ask a question, feel free to actually write them in the comments or in the question and answer box, of course. Now, this comes a quite interesting, actually tricky question, which is how to treat, how to manage patients that have a, a high sensitive gag reflex, mm. especially when you ask them to gargle first. <sighs> Yeah, I mean, gargling tends not to be such a problem because they're quite used to 
um, having uh, fluid and food at the back of the throat and they feel quite in control. My experience of the sensitive gag reflex is that, that patients that are very anxious tend to have the worst um, gag reflexes. Look, you can only do what you can do. I have patients who I can't get past the, the front teeth um, because the, the gag reflex is just so sensitive. You have to manage those patients. You have to make a decision about whether proceeding with that aerosol generating procedure is the right thing to do in that situation. If you feel that that patient's um, gag reflex is too severe and you're not going to be able to adequately manage that aerosol and adequately treat the patient, then you have to make a decision. I don't have a magic wand. I don't have a solution to patients with gag reflexes, unfortunately. Um, but my experience is that they are few and far between, particularly uh, the way I work with, with guided biofilm therapy because the treatment is, is very quick and um, very gentle and very comfortable for the patients so their anxieties generally start to reduce and, and there's all sorts of holistic things that patients can look to but that's out of my field of expertise. As a, as a clinician you have to make that decision and if you feel that a patient with a sensitive gag reflex is going to be coughing a lot and retching a lot, particularly during these times. And that's probably not a patient that I would be comfortable proceeding Treating. with. Yeah. So of course, there are many questions about the Optragate. First of all, uh, Optragate is a single use because some is asking of if it is yes, or not. It is. Of course, yeah. it's a single use, definitely. You don't want to sterilize it. And uh, secondly, how do you think that is actually helping uh, in terms of, so is it actually absolutely recommended first? And the second part of the question is, how do you use it also, do you use it also for the piezo treatment, even if it's not yeah. just about hair so, and yeah. hair flow? So in this case, the, the reason for the um, Optragate is to retract those soft tissues. So sometimes when we're aspirating, and it depends which patient you've got, the older they get, the ten, and the more teeth they lose, the worse it tends to be. The soft tissues can, can start to cave in a little bit, and then they, they're sucking up their aspirator and they're clouding the vision and 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 then the spray gets directed somewhere else because the soft tissues got in the way so the idea is that you retract those soft soft tissues so that you've got this clear working field and it really does work it really does happen so you're almost holding those tissues out of the way so that you can see clearly um, and more importantly so that you can get your aspirator where it needs to be to get the right angulation without any interruption so we put this in at the start of the appointment after the patient's done their pre-op rinse and it stays in the patient's mouth throughout the um, throughout the, the course of the treatment. It looks uncomfortable in the pictures, but, it, but it's actually not uncomfortable. Um, it's actually very comfortable and patients tend to tolerate it really well, whether that's because they feel more comfortable, whether it's because we're not sucking on the soft tissues. Um, I don't know, but patients do tend to tolerate it very well. It's really just about finding the right size in the end. It all comes down to yeah. it, basically. So yeah, use three, the ruler three on sizes, the packet. if I don't remember wrong. So once you manage to understand the size, they usually tell it very well. Um, so this is, again, there are many questions about the combinations or that are recommended. So maybe uh, I think it could be interesting if you recap which are the correct uh, sequence of uh, liquids to be used for the uh, rinse. For the, the, the initial rings. Okay, let's go back to that. Slide. Because there are many questions about how to change, how to swap, but definitely the one you show are really the recommended. Yeah, so these are all recommendations, remember. The, these aren't the musts, these are the recommendations. So based on the knowledge that we have, as I said earlier, it's, it's sensible to conclude that the hydrogen peroxide mouth rinse, which is antiviral, um, coupled with um, a mouth rinse like chlorhexidine or CPC, which is antibacterial, together is going to reduce the viral and bacterial load in that aerosol. Yeah, so your two options are um, 
recommendations are that we stick with our uh, antibacterial, our pre-op chlorhexidine or CPC, depending which country you're in, and we do that for 30 to 60 seconds, um, but also that we add in a, um, a hydrogen peroxide rinse. So that needs to be at least 0.5% for 15 at least 15 seconds and then the second option is that you use a combination mouthwash which has both these antiviral and antibacterial properties in it so that would be viro pro x um, which is 1.5 percent hydrogen peroxide and 0.05 percent cpc either of these options is perfectly adequate what we don't want to do is move over to hydrogen peroxide and stop thinking about our, our previous pre-op rinse which we've been recommending for years um, and, and always have done we need to find something that combines the two together perfect so unfortunately there are still many questions but we are <laughs> running out of time so uh unfortunately well we have to uh, feel free you know, people can ask me things. I'm always on the on forums, on the mm -hmm. Facebook forums and Instagram. Exactly. And GBT so feel user. free. They can con GBT user group. I'm exactly. always on there. So you can contact me. We can con we can continue this conversation if we need to. And there are people asking uh, about uh, learning and for education, um, education courses for dental assistants, mm -hmm. uh, dental nurses and so on. And of course, we invite you to stay on the Swiss Dental Academy online website. Of course, in this very moment, there is not really a lot of uh, regional, <laughs> so actual courses, physical courses going on. We move definitely to a lot of digital courses, but as soon as the time will allow, we'll definitely the Swiss Dental Academy online will go back to not just be online, of course. So thank you again very much, Faye, for your presentation. Uh, it's been a pleasure. My and pleasure, um, no. hopefully we will see soon for some more webinars and definitely again the gbt uh, users group on facebook is where you. people can find you very often thank you again